If things are not going on well in your family, you don't run away from your family, you start asking yourself, what can be done about this thing? Whoever solves a problem becomes a hero. Heroes are exalted. You can solve problems and be jobless. You can solve problems and be broke. That is true. So life is not about what you are doing. Life is about what you are solving. Yes. Solve a problem. What are you solving in the church where you are? What are you solving in the place where you are working? You are not but getting power for pay rise if you are not solving more than others. You cannot come and say I have been serving here for the longest I deserve a pay rise. Serving for the longest, we will compare your years of service with the amount of results you brought in. And if we are not impressed, we cannot promote you. In fact, if you keep on bothering us, we will suck you. Yeah. Because if what you are bringing to us in the context of profit is not good and you are making the most of noise, you are a liability. Mm. Nobody employs you to pay you more. Everybody employs you to bring more profit to them. Yeah. We, nobody employs you to pay you more. In fact, every employer watches with one eye. Mm. How can I reduce his pay? Because the employer wants the most out of you and give you the least for it. Hakuna muajiri, anaye muajiri, ili uwe tajiri. The employer employs you so you can give him the highest profit. Now, that depends on how much of his problems you are solving. Now, when you solve more, you stand out. That gives you a backbone for the game for better pay. And you become an asset. He gets afraid of losing you. Why? It is because of you that he's making more. So, you can pull strings now. Mm. Now you can begin for better pay. You can say, sir, with all due respect. And speak like, speak like who? Jacob. Is it Genesis 30 verse 30?
Hello? This is the book. Hello? Hello? What you heard before I came was a little, and now Jacob is confronting Laban. He says, I'm sorry, you, sir. I've increased your wealth. The yearly turnover is better than I found it. You've got healthier livestock, more. You are richer, better, because of me. I brought God in this house. I brought a blessing, I brought increase, I brought prosperity. My question is, what have you brought to the ministry? Leaders don't look for, leaders make. And Jacob said, I have blessed your family, it's now time for me to bless my family. I've served in your company. Now it's time for me to branch out. I want to establish my own establishment. I want to become my own boss. I've served you well. And what does the scripture say in Luke 16? He that is faithful in what is another man's shall be trusted. What is his own? Shall be given. What is his own? He says, I've served you, sir. I've served you. And any time any of your animals was torn by the beasts of the field, I never put to you a name took it on myself and I paid you the living end. I've served you faithfully, I've grown your company, I've grown the church, I've been a good departmental leader, I've been a good head of operations, I've done all, it's time now for me to go and start my own. Now when you're arguing like that, you're telling him you can do without him. And if that's the place of work and they look, they tell you, give us two days, we'll get back to you. They give us two days, they're going through the records. Who of all our employees has made us do better? Who has worked most and solved most and brought more clients to this company? Who has helped us become better? Who has put us back again on the map? Who has given us a good reputation among our competitors? Who? That person. Is that person? Then we can't let him go. We can't let him go. So they want to bribe you with a better pay. You hear something, nothing, and making noise. My friend, you'll be fired while you're in bed. You'll find a dog slipped under the door of your house, a letter slipped under your door. You will not even get to work to get a sucking letter. It will be brought home to you. Yeah. Is that true, Professor? Yes. Don't make noise when you're solving nothing. Ryan Dinger is a very good, shrewd politician. He knows how to repackage his political party for the games. He goes around the country and he enjoys the euphoria and people follow him like nobody's business. And he opens ODM offices everywhere and people line up and come into ODM and give them coffees and give them orange t-shirts. And he popularizes the party across the country until ODM is the party and Rahila is the man. Now he's in a good place to begin with whoever wins the presidency. Yeah. his wife, you know I love you, and you know that I'm dying for you. And the wife said, you always say that, but you never do it. <laughs> Where are they, Mr. Husbands? Mr. Husbands, let me see your hands. Uh, uh, you know we are supposed to die for our wives. You know that. Mr. Husband. Oh, if you did not know, no. On a light note, there's this uh, British guy. He stands on the altar in Mombasa. He wants money in Kenya. And the officiating officer regretted what he said. Because he asked them to. Christ died for the church because he loved the church. Are you ready to die for this woman? And Muzungu being Muzungu thought this thing through. You don't know, you know, really, really, you really die. He says, Sir, I'm not ready to die. I'm the one who's called off.
Or anything that tells us he's always ready to die, but he never dies. It's like that husband who keeps telling the wife, you know I will die for you. And the wife says, you keep on saying that, but you never do it. Against my shepherd, against the man who is my companion, 
So he's yelling on the armies. Strike the ship and the ship will be scattered. Then I'll turn my hand against the little ones. God is wiping out the community. That's how angry he was with the Jews of the time. a sheep by striking sheep because the gravity that holds together the sheep in the fall is the shepherd. In the shepherd all the sheep consist. Have you read that verse in Colossians? Colossians? Have you read it? In Colossians 1? In him Consist. He is the, he is the center power that holds all things together. You call it gravity. Scripture calls it Christ. The power that's holding on that chair is not gravity. It's Christ. It is Him that holds things in their places. That's what Paul says. He says, if you move Christ, things fly away. Things scatter. In Him, all things hold together. Another translation says, if you strike the sheep, but the shepherd is still intact, you will not start the sheep. Because in the shepherd, all the sheep consist, hold together. If you strike youth, but the youth leader is intact, you cannot scatter on the stone anymore. But if the youth can be struck and get scattered, and the youth leader wasn't struck, we've got a bad youth leader. What holds the people is the leader, not their prayer. Because leadership is a covering. A covering holds things together. So, the other of armies, the Lord of all says, strike the shepherd, don't strike the sheep. You want to scatter the sheep, strike the shepherd. The sheep will be without a shepherd. They will go astray, they will wander, they will scatter. Where a leader is, there is. Confusion, deformation is a sign of lack of leadership. Leadership brings order. If you're a person who loves order, you are a leader. It is in you. You may not be refined, you may not be polished, you may not be developed. You may not be refined and made, but in you the potential is real. It's there. If you're the kind of person who enters into a house and in your house the knife is on the door, the sufria is on the bed, the napkin of the baby is on the sink of the place, you are not a leader. You're the one who does not shower, does not brush his teeth, does not comb his hair, does not cut his nails. You're not a leader. You're a madman. You're a mad girl. Where there's a leader, there is order. There's what? Time to come and say, let there be order. Let there be a leader. When a leader walks into this hall and chairs are not arranged well, a leader will start arranging them well. That's a leader. A leader of order. Start bringing order. 
Give me your sons. Don't my children, when you wake up in the morning, before you yawn, make your bed. Before you go to the toilet to susu, make your bed. Before you go to the kitchen to fix breakfast, make your bed. I make my bed even when I'm staying in a hotel and I know they're going to move the bedsheets. I still make the bed. It, it, it will haunt me if I don't make my bed because I don't like chaos. I don't like things out of order. I'm a leader. And the order comes because you know what is out of order. In Titus 1 verse 5, all the Titus, for this reason I left you in that you may set in order what is lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. I left you there to set in order what is lacking. Sometimes things are lacking not because they are absent. They are lacking because they are out of order. What you could be looking for is a bed. The problem is it is out of order. You think it is missing? No, it is in confusion. When there is order, there is provision. That's what Paul is telling Titus. So don't look too far. A leader does not go abroad to solve solutions. A leader creates solutions abroad at home. I was speaking to board members of a certain corporation on the area of creation. And I was telling them that the highest form of creation today is recreation. And sometimes in recreation, we must learn the art of recycling. God makes materials available. Some of them have been used, some of them have been abused. But we can recycle and reorganize them and make them into good use. And I read the scriptures. Isaac tells his son Esau, go to the fields, hunt, kill, make it the way I love it, bring to me that I may eat and bless me if I die. The mother is eavesdropping. She hears everything and goes to her favorite son, Jacob, and says, I have what your father said to your brother, but that shall not happen. You are the one going to make that blessing when we were mother. I want you to go behind the house and get a, cook, a kid, a young goat, bring it here, I will dress it, prepare it, cook it, flavor it the way your father loves it, I will give you to go and present your father so that he may eat and bless you instead of blessing your brother. So let's remove the cars and the supplanted thing out of the story and let's look at the context of production. Esau went abroad to find raw materials to bring home to process to present to the father. Jacob used locally available materials to produce the same results that somebody went abroad to get. That's what I was teaching you. Sometimes you don't have to look far for what you're looking for. You can use what is available at home, behind your house, and produce the same product you are intending to import raw materials from. Amen. A leader does not look far. He leader looks around. Because sometimes things are lacking because they're out of order. Where there is order, there is provision. So those things you think you're missing. Even the husband you think you're not getting in your church. He may just be in some form of confusion. He's just a hard man around. He needs to be organized through obeying God, taught properly, taught how to dress, how to shower, brush his teeth. And you realize, ah, could be that useless guy can be my husband. My husband. A leader is a creator. A leader creates solutions. A leader creates answers. A leader creates ways. The greatest blessing God can give any society is a leader, not things. When God sees a crisis, when God sees a problem, when God sees a need, when God sees panic, when God sees fear, God sends a leader. When God sees a problem, God sends what? When God sees a need, God sends what? When God sees a vacuum, God sends what? When God sees hunger, war, conflict, God sends what? So when you read the scriptures,
scriptures in the Old Testament particularly, and you'll find the Bible saying, I look for someone. I look for a man. God was not look, looking for anybody running around, idling, having nothing to do. God was looking for a leader. When God sees a problem, God looks for a leader. A leader is a solution. Then a leader creates solutions. You cannot create what you don't have material for. The makeup of a leader is the material for solution. Where a leader is, solutions will be found. When people come to you as a leader and say, we don't know what we are going to do. And when the leader say, I also don't know what we are going to do. You should be sacked. <laughs> Moses, in Exodus 14, can read it verse 13, 14. Fourteen from verse thirteen. And Moses said to the people. Do not be afraid. Where there is a leader, there is no fear. Tell something. Whether Ruto is president or Raila Modi Tinga Hama is a president. Where there is a leader, there is no fear. It does not matter. Where there is a leader, there is no fear. If there is fear, where there is a leader, we got it wrong. Afraid, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which He will accomplish for you today. A leader even gives timelines. We are going to fix this thing in the next one week. That's all. Let's crack our heads, brethren. We don't have time to sleep. We must fix this thing before the new year begins. Let's get going. Let's get it done. Push yourself. Pull up your socks. Tighten your belt. We've got one week to the next. Let's get it going. He gave a time today. He says, Mr. Dipson, you see today, you shall not see them again forever. And indeed, that is the last time the Egyptians pursue the Israelites. A leader does not assume, a leader processes his thoughts. Don't just give people hopes that you will not be fulfilled. Don't make false promises. That's not leadership. That's commandship. Don't tell people, tomorrow we shall have this and this. Next year I will do this and this for you. In the next two months I'm going to do this. In the next one week I'm going to do this thing. And the time elapses and all we have are empty promises. That is bad leadership. Don't promise what you cannot deliver. Stop shooting yourself on the feet. Evaluate your thoughts. Look at the possibilities. Look at it from all angles. See what is possible and make solid conclusions and judgments. Because you know you've got some persuasion about what you're saying. He knew his God. Moses stayed with God long enough to know how long it takes God to fix a situation. And he knew how long it was going to take God to fix the Egyptian problem. And when he said this, Verse number 14. Exodus 14, verse 14. The Lord will fight for you. The Lord will fight for you. And you shall hold your peace. It's lifted my eyes to one who never fails. He knows the source of his help. And in church, in as much as you're a leader, don't let people think you're a demigod. You are representing God. And they need to look above you and see the possibilities in God which are unlimited. And that God is able to do much more than they are expecting. And when people have their eyes on God, they will blame you. 
Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying to me? What is happening with this man? Before the people, he is a giant. Before the God, before God, he is needy. He needs help. A leader does not cry before people, a leader cries before God. A leader does not show weakness to people, he shows strength. If he is weak, that is between him and God. You don't spread yourself too thin before people who look up to you, who depend on you, and you show them your vulnerability, and you show them how weak you are. What do you want them to do? You are killing them. You are like the witch doctor that somebody comes to for help and finds crying. The witch doctor is crying. We need to tell the witch doctor your problems. But Moses knew that I am a leader because God is helping me. And sometimes things do not work out well for me and I also get scared. And I also say it because I believe God, but if God does not come through, it is going to paint me as a bad leader. And it's, not, it's going to change my integrity as a leader. If every word I've spoken does not come to pass, my word will be worthless. And a leader without a worthy word is unworthy leader. Your word must be good. A leader that will just say it when people feel good. Kingdom politics is full of leaders who say things to make people feel good because they want votes. And that is the curse of democracy. You can move heaven and earth, go to hell and back to get votes. And once you've gotten the votes and landed the office you wanted, then you can become the demon you are always. He comes to God and he starts to cry. And I can imagine what kind of cry he's making. He said, God, I've given my word. I've spoken on your behalf. I've represented you. Whether I spoke the right thing or the wrong thing, now it has to happen. You have to defend me on this one for your integrity's sake and for my sake. And so, bear with my excesses for now, but just let what I said come to pass. It is good for your name. It is good for mine too. What did Elijah tell God? When Elijah had built the altar and put the firewood and cut the animal to pieces and put it there and dragged back the trenches, how did he pray? He said, Oh Lord God, God of Abraham and God of Isaac and God of Jacob, I pray that you hear me today and let it be known that you are God and there is no other. And let it be known that I am your servant and have done everything according to your word. Lord, your integrity and my integrity are on the line. If you don't come through at an hour like this, that's how I'm seeing Moses crying. And as a leader, you must learn how to cry to God. Because a leader's word must be worthy. Your word must be good. Your word should not bounce like a bouncing chick. If you say it, it should be solid, not hollow. If you say it, it should be substantial. It should be verifiable. It should be factual. When you say it, it should have integrity to fulfill itself. Your word must be good because you're a leader. Stop reckless talking, you're a leader. Stop making false promises, you're a leader. Stop saying things you know you don't have the power to do and you don't see how it's going to happen. You may not have the power to do it, but you know how it will happen. That is good enough. You can still say it. Because in the process of saying it, even if you don't have the power to effect it, but you know how it will happen, you can explain and people can take shape, stand in their places and help your word come to pass. When Kibaki became president, he said, when I become president in January, primary school will be free, secondary school shall be free. At that time, our economy had been so badly beaten under President Moy. We were in bad books with IMF, with, with World Bank, with African Development Bank. We would not receive any help. Nobody would look our way to help us with finances. Yet Kibaki campaigns and says, if I become president, free primary school will be there. Free secondary school will be there. And as a result of have it, he became the president. And he announced on his immigration address, he said, in this January, primary school is free. Secondary school is free. And there was no money. 
but because of his good will and his good intentions, and he knew what it needed, he shared his vision. The nation started rallying behind him. Nation started sending money to Kenya. People started having faith in his administration because he's a man of his word. He knows the way. He may not have everything for the way, but he knows what needs to be done. And so he shares the vision. And people came behind him, and money came in. And believe you me, January came, and private school was free, and secondary school was free. Now that is an example of good leadership. He had his own shortcomings and failures, but that's not the context of our discussion now. We are looking at the what he said and how it came to pass. And Moses goes to cry to God. The leader must know God. Don't lead based on your training. Don't lead based on your skill. Lead crying to God every day. Leadership is a hard. She's so peacefully, she looks like a goddess. She's so good. 
So I sneak out of bed quietly. I go to the living room to cry. And I say, God, I just feel tired. Ministry is hard. And money is scarce. And there's so much to do. And I keep telling people I'm not listening to. And I keep sharing your heart with them and they don't believe it. And they're dragging themselves to respond to divine instruction that I give them. And I tell them to go left and they keep going right. And I tell them to rise up to the occasion and they keep on flopping. And I don't know what to do and I am tired and I've come to my wit's end. And I don't want to be a bad man and I don't want to be a bad leader and I need help. And only you can help me and I need you now before morning. Because by morning I'm standing before them and they need hope and they need a promise. And they need a life and they need strength. And the sick need healing and the jobless need jobs. And they expect me to say something that will come to pass. And I don't know what to say. And you are gone. And I need your help. And I cried to God the whole night until morning. I said, God, if you don't help me, I'm finished. I'm done. I don't know what else I can do. I don't know what else I can say. And leadership is hard. And this thing is killing me every day. And I'm doing my best as a place things that's all apart. And I think I'm telling them the mind of God. And it is not even happening. And I quote the scripture. And it is not coming to pass. But you are God. And you can do it. And you are able. And you are powerful. And you are dependable. And I trust in you. And I depend on you. And then I come back to sleep at 5 a.m. I find that she's still sleeping like a goddess. And in the morning, I'm in my suit. And I stand before the people. And I start saying things. And people start saying, My eyes are open. I see it now. I'm getting the solution. And then I see things starting to change in the ministry. And I see people who are failing starting to succeed. And I see people who are going off coming back on track. And I see people who are weak getting strong. And I see people who are poor becoming millionaires. And I start seeing tithes coming in and offerings and gifts start coming in. And I say, God, I come back to I say, God, you did it, man. You did it. You saved your name. You saved my name. You saved your people. We are good. And I thank you. And I come into your gates with thanksgiving. And I begin to thank him with the 12 names of the 12 tribes of Israel. Because the Bible says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving. And the Bible says in Revelation 21, verse number 12, that the city had a high wall and 12 gates. And all the gates are the names of the 12 sons of Israel. And I begin to thank him according to Reuben. And I thank him according to... to, to, to uh, the second son is uh, Simon Simeon. And I thank him according to the third son who is called Levi. And I thank him according to the fourth son who is called Judah. And I thank him according to all the revelations of them because he has come true for me. The leadership is not easy. The leadership is hard. And he went to pray to God. And God said to him, Why are you crying? Tell the people to go forth. Leadership, as I close, leadership is not always by experience. Leadership is largely by revelation. You will not always be taking people where you have been. Because some of these parts, you are also a fast timer on them. The only difference between you and the people is that you have the revelation of the path. You haven't been there. You haven't gone there. So yes, while it is true that a leader takes the people where he has been, that you can't take people where you've been, that is 50% true. Moses had never been to Egypt, to Canaan. Joshua was there, but Moses hadn't been there before. And sometimes you're not leading people by experience. You are leading them by revelation. You understand the dynamics of the journey. You haven't gone through it, but you understand it by revelation. And you are explaining to them a revelation. You are explaining to them the journey that you've never taken. You are explaining to them a destination that you've never come to. That's leadership. That's why a leader must connect to God. So that you have what? Revelation. 
God brings people under you that you've never met, that you did not grow up with. You don't know their backgrounds. You don't know what they have been through. Some of them have been to hell seven times and came back. Their upbringing is totally different from your upbringing. You don't know the things they're dealing with right now. But God says, this is the thing I've given you. And I want you to make the best out of them to get to where I want you all to be. It is not always easy. That's why a leader must be a friend of God. You must be a friend of God. So that you can lead them by revelation. So God tells Moses, I want you to tell the people to move forward. Stop crying now. Move forward. Move forward into what? Into the water. Move forward. God gave them strength. You shall raise your rod over the Red Sea. And by a strong east wind, I will blow on the water the whole night and divide the waters. People shall be welcome to the land. My friend, that was an experiment. That was not an experience. Moses was going to experiment with the people, the word of God. Moses had never split in water before. Moses had never been across that sea before. He was going to experiment in what he had from God. He was going to experiment every what he had from God. He had never been there before. And that's why he must know God. So that when you stand before people to make a promise, you're making them a promise from the heart of God. When he is a Lift up your rod, stretch up your hand over the sea and divide. The children of Israel shall go on right now to the midst of the sea. Experimental. No experience. That's experimental. Leading by revolution. Not by experience. Taking God at every word he says, no matter how illogical it may sound. It's like Jesus telling Simon when the disciples saw him walking on water. And, and they saw him coming and they thought he was a devil. And they were afraid. He said, don't be afraid. It's me. Come on. It's me, guys. Don't be afraid. The person said, if it is you, then command me to come to you on this one. And Jesus said, it's up. Come. Be. Amba. It's up. Be the God up. And stop on the water. And walked towards Jesus. Peter had never walked on water before. But he was hanging on every word that Jesus said. Because his promises are sure, not empty. He doesn't say it to make you feel good. He says it because he's got the power to do it. You need to be a friend of God, be a leader. You are a leader in your capacity and in your right. And nobody should look down on you in any way. Destroy. Shall we stand?